Okay, so just to review, how so we knew to do the um, um, sorry, what's that called? The enolate the deprotonating the alpha carbon. Yeah, we enolate do formation that on that side on that molecule, not the other one. Over here. Yeah, because a part what I wanted to do was to to do it there so that I could put my on minus number five five so I could put my minus charge on um, the O and then have the O attack one on the other molecule. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Well, let me think about uh, it. It's possible there could be more than one mechanism, so let me think whether that would okay. work. But that's not what he does either, so. He did the way we did it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's possible there could be another way, so give me a second and we'll, we'll see whether that could work too. So. So that would put a double bond here, wouldn't it? Um, so if the oxygen uh, attacks, um, you would end up with a double bond between, uh, so you're, you're asking uh, why doesn't this form a uh, enolate? So yeah, so that would put a double bond here, right? Yeah. All right, um, but there is no double bond in the product. So that's one reason why we shouldn't do it that way. Okay. I mean, uh, another reason is, uh, again, uh, th this is maybe not too reliable, but usually in an enolate, it's usually the alpha carbon that's the nucleophile, not the oxygen. It's usually the alpha carbon. That's why I really prefer, when I draw an enolate, to show the negative charge on the carbon and not on the oxygen. But later that oxygen can, in fact, attack. We're not counting on it. Yeah, so sometimes, I, I don't want to be too, um, too uh, uh, determinative about that. So, sometimes the oxygen can be a nucleophile, but right. it's usually the carbon. All right, so basically, I think that if you try to do it the way you were suggesting, it just won't come out right. Um, so basically, you just have to try the experiment, and you'll see that you're not getting um, the product uh, that uh, you ultimately, oh, I got it. Here's why. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to erase some of this. Do you have this in yeah, your notes? Because okay. you said before that it would create a double bond, and there's no double bond in the product, but we just did a, an example where we create a double bond, but then we break it using something like an H, so. I'm actually going to number this oxygen. I don't usually number oxygen. It's going to number this out so I can keep track of it. So here's this oxygen over here, the number four. So based on the method that you wanted to use, we could call this the number five carbon, right? Mm -hmm. So then this would be the number five carbon, right? Oh, maybe this is not going to work today. Six and then seven. Six and uh, then seven. So you would have the oxygen here um, attacking uh, the number one. Um, and then you would have this oxygen on the six, and you have this uh, on um, the seven. Do you want to maybe just show what it will look like if we attack with the O? Like, just start with that. So if we deprotonate the oxygen, we'll get this. Same time. 
Okay, so um, if the oxygen attacked the number one carbon, um, you would get a product that looks like this. Notice how I'm still trying to draw this to look as much like the final product as possible. This is a good technique to try to draw your intermediate to look as much like the final product as possible. Um, so this is what we would get so far, all right? Um, and of course, then we could protonate this oxygen, so that's no trouble. So it seems like this is working out great. It seems like this is working out um, great now. Um, but the problem is we still need to form a bond between um, the number three and the number seven. Oh, wait, but there's no way that the number three can attack this number seven. Um, yeah, there's no way uh, that we can do that. That's right. Okay. Uh, another way to put it is the hard thing is forming carbon-carbon bonds. So that's a good thing to get out of the way first here. Mm -hmm. The first thing we did was form the carbon-carbon bond. Well, um, we needed to have a... Uh, so in order to form that carbon-carbon bond, we had to have the number three attack uh, the number five uh, over here. That oxygen, though, see there's five and then six. Or you're going from the left side. Okay. Yeah, let me show this. Because uh, I thought five and six were on the right side, and then that wouldn't work. Yeah, okay. One more thing that maybe we'll clarify this again. So. So, basically the question here is, we know we're going to have to form a carbon-carbon bond down here. And the question is, how are we going to do that? Are we going to do that by having the number three attack the number five, or having the number three attack the number seven? Well, there's no way the number three could attack the number seven, because there's no carbonyl over here. In order to form this carbon-carbon bond, we're going to have to have the number three attack the number five, because we know how to have that happen. We can make this into an enolate and have it attack the carbonyl but we can't have it attack the number seven. That means that this number four oxygen must be down here. And that explains why you can't use it as this oxygen up here. So we need this carbonyl to be attacked by the number three. And again, we need this carbonyl to be attacked by the number three. And once it's attacked by the number three, that would put this oxygen down here. And that explains why we can't use this oxygen to attack the number one. We can't be in two places at the same time. All right, yeah, that, that's not easy. Again, sometimes you just have to do some experiments and see if they happen. Notice that when, I, when we were first doing this, you were asking me what's going to happen, and I was trying to do it in my head, and I was feeling miserably, right? It didn't matter how long I stared at it, I couldn't get it right. And then you said, why don't you just draw it out? And that made things a lot clearer. So everybody, including me, tends to be pig-headed and try to do it in their head. But nobody's smart enough to do these things in their head. You've got to try it out uh, on paper, at least until you've done maybe a couple thousands of them like the instructor has. Then you can do them in the head, but you have to do them on paper. And again, there's no way to even have a fighting chance here without thinking about the numbers. You really need the numbers to match up in the two pictures. So the main point is we are doing an enolate type chemistry, and we know right. to work with number three opposed to two, because really, and opposed to six, because really three is the one that's bond. bond. Well, you could two or three. Those are equivalent. That Sorry, wasn't the I mean opposed yeah. to six. That's right. Um, so, uh, and again, the, uh, so again, working through the numbers, so again, he knows this is a hard problem. What were the clues he gave? He gave you this landmark of the 18. So that proves that this must be the number three carbon, and then we know the number three has to form a carbon-carbon bond. And the only way it could possibly form a carbon-carbon bond is with this atom. So we know this atom must be this one. Once we make that connection, everything starts to fall into place for us. Remember how I was asking you, what was the difference between the number three on the left and the number three on the right? And I was pressing you to be as specific as possible. It's not good enough to say the number three is different, and it's not good enough to say the number three has formed a new bond. You have to say, the number three over here has formed a new bond to a carbon. And then we should say, what's the carbon over here it's going to bond to? So you have to be as specific as possible about what's changing. Thank right? you. So we're definitely doing some hard problems today. Remember that after today's session, before you do any new problems, you should go back and just redo the problems that we just did. And you'll probably find that they're still pretty darn challenging, even though we just did them. Um, before you do new problems, make sure you can um, do the problems that we've just gone through. Uh, that's how I learned organic chemistry. I learned organic chemistry by redoing the same problems over and over. And oftentimes, I was like stunned. It would take me like four times before I could get it right, even though I'd just seen the answer key a couple hours ago. So that's important. OK. Uh, so where are we now, sorry? 303B. Okay. Oh, excellent. I'm 
another complicated mechanism problem. All right. So.